yes, indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome to the December 24th, Christmas Eve edition of The Story Behind the Story. Oh, my goodness. Oh, the world has not ended. Surprise, surprise, surprise. As Gomer Pyle would say, surprise, surprise, surprise. We're still going strong, folks. Yes, indeed, I had a great show planned for you Friday, the end of the world day, the 21st, <laughs> but, uh, but it doesn't matter. I was, uh, was going to talk to you Friday about the Las Vegas odds makers. You know, everything in Las Vegas, you know, you go to the right casino or the right bookie, and you can bet on just about everything, folks. Well, you can even take a bet on the end of the world on <laughs> the 21st day of December. I, I kid you not. There was a, a book. There were, there were odds makers. There was – it was – well, I want to talk about a soccer bet. Wow. You know, there were people that actually bet on this thing and talk about a soccer bet. Here's why it's a soccer bet, folks. First of all, the odds are – the odds makers put it at 300 million to one – that the Earth was going to have a cataclysm and end of the world cycle, you know, they that would end the 21st at midnight. 300 million to one odds. Now, so that means a $10 bet. What's what's 10 times 300 million? Three billion. But see, they weren't the odds. The odds were 300 million to one, but the uh, $10 bet returned you roughly about 40 million dollars. I understand. So for every ten million dollars put into the casino bookies, they had to pay out hundreds of millions of dollars. The bottom line is, many people apparently placed bets of thousand, two thousand dollars. Why is that a sucker bet? <laughs> it should be obvious. It should be obvious. If the world ends, the casino I can't pay off anyway. So what the hell difference does it make? <laughs> All you're doing is paying off a casino. Uh, it's about uh, it's about the same thing as uh, a slot machine. You know, whether you the only way the casino loses is if people don't put money in the slot machine. They always have their percentage take, and that's the reality, folks. Why do you think Las Vegas and Atlantic City, you know, is controlled by these Jewish mafiosos? They they know that the gullible goy will come in and just uh, think in their mind they have that one chance in a million, the, the erstwhile dumb and dumber movie. You mean I have a chance in a million to one to to date you? I mean, come on. It, it's it's crazy, but people are crazy. They're not. I, don't, I, I just don't get it. Hundreds of thousands of people literally thought the world was ending Friday. And a lot of other people said, well, you know, it's it's a time to bunker up. It's time to hunker up because they may be right. I just laugh and said, my goodness, folks, you don't understand the scriptures. You don't understand the plan. You don't understand Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. You don't understand it. And thus I have to come on the radio and try and explain it. I don't know, folks. I don't know if it's even... Worth the time to try. The people are so stupid, so gullible, so much of an ignoramus they can't even, you know, pull their head out of their posterior. What's the use, you know? One at a time, maybe. One at a time. In the <laughs> Salt Lake Tribune, news, and I need to talk about this a little bit in depth today. The... Um, Salt Lake Tribune newspaper on Saturday morning. Of course, front page headline news, you know, just pumping up the hyperbole, the hype of the Connecticut shootings. They just keep it going. They had a front page story. They aired a front page story. And the central message was we can never be safe. People can never feel secure and safe in this world anymore. You see, seven years ago, well, actually more like 
five and a half years ago, there was a shooting in downtown Salt Lake City at a place called Trolley Square. There was, again, just a tragedy. A crazy guy comes in with a gun, starts blasting away, and then gets shot and killed himself. Typical M.O. So they dredge that back up. They dredge back up the horrors of the Virginia Tech shooting. They dredge up everything they can. And again, it's fear-mongering. It's fear-based. We can never be free of fear in this country until we give up some of our freedoms because freedom is gives a ticket to these crazy people to come in and wreak havoc. So we've got thus thus we've got to give up our freedoms. We got to give up our right to own guns first of all. So I began to think Saturday I, I said my goodness is this agenda just here in the Salt Lake Tribune newspaper or is it all across the country? In the Salt Lake Tribune front page in the bottom of the front page you see a little iconic logo folks it has a little strip of color and then it has a logo called a media news group newspaper a media news group newspaper well what is a media news group so I went on to my computer and did a search and found out everything I needed to know about Media News Group. Incredible. They own 54 daily newspapers across this country, the Media News Group, and they own a TV station up in Alaska, in Anchorage, Alaska. They own weekly newspapers as well. The prime markets, you know, there's 50 states in this union, 54 newspapers. They basically control most of the news. And the publisher, the publishers of the different newspapers they control are all given specific instructions. Now, who really controls the media news group? You know, they may have a CEO or a president that may be just a figurehead, but you really got to go deeper to find out really who put this together, who controls it. When you say, when I say who controls the media news group, you got to find out, A, number one, who put up the money and thus is calling the shots because, you see, in the Edomite world of finance, of Baal, of Baalile, he who has the gold makes the rules. He who has... The money, the buck stops at the desk of the banker, in other words. And so, surprise, surprise, surprise. Find out who put up the money, who purchased the Salt Lake Tribune newspaper rights in the year 2000. This media news group that purchased it. Guess who put up the money, folks? Uh, a, an international hedge fund group called Alden. And you look at who's in charge of that. It's Alden Worldwide Financial Group, and you see it's a guy named Eli Combs. Eli Combs. Yeah, Eli. E Eli, uh, uh, an Edomite, who graduated with an MBA from Yale. He's an Elihu Eli of Yale University. And they control this media, this news group. Can you spell Illuminati, folks? I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. Right out of Yale, the Skull and Bones, Yale University. I, I'm, it's just amazing that the Alden Financial Group is also basically a subsidiary. The officers of Alden is basically, are basically officers of one Goldman Sachs. And you just don't need to look any further, do you? You wonder why nobody in the media, in the mainstream media, in the newspapers, the Associated Press and other control organs, you wonder why you see they 
will never tell you the truth about Israel. Well, they'll never tell you the truth about the Edomites versus the true bloodline of Israel. You'll never hear them talk about it because, you see, it's the very scribes of Babylon, the scribes and the Pharisees who crucified Jesus, Yeshua, the Savior, are the very ones controlling what you read and what you hear on the television, the news media. There's no doubt about it. Now, the Salt Lake Tribune is just one of 54 primary organs throughout all the regions of this great country that are controlled by this select group. So you shouldn't wonder why they want to promote and hype the fear of the Connecticut shootings. They'll never, you know, I, I wrote a letter to the editor on Monday, the following day after showing, you know, the similarities between all of the shooters, between, you know, they're all, they're, there's a psycho low nut gunman that never really, you know, the, the, the facts of uh, the matter being on, SSRI inhibitors, the serotonin uptake inhibitors, the lapse of time, Dr. Yolanda Lassier's incredible work documenting gene structures, gene pools, specific genome deficiencies that cause absolute blackout moments where people on these inhibitors have no control whatsoever on their actions. And if they're not being controlled, who then controls them, you see? Oh, my goodness, folks. This detailed letter to the editor, in, you know, inviting the story, a story to be written about this most important topic was absolutely sloughed off and ignored. Nothing there to like. I'm not going to go down a conspiracy theory hole. It's mocking, absolutely incredible. But you can't ignore the facts present. The ne and I never said one thing about the Columbine massacres, the the links to Jewish temples of these shooters, these Jewish, either Jewish temples or synagogues or Jewish bloodlines. It's amazing how the links are there. And it's also quite interesting that these genetic deficiencies are also tied to people of the Edomite persuasion, g g genetics of Edomites, whether it's Asperger's syndrome the genetic deficiency, you see, that, that made the Palo settlement, these so-called Ashkenazis, Khazars, such a despicable race. These descendants of Gog and Magog, these so-called biblical name given them, troglodytes from the mountains of Mount Sair, which is in Jordan, modern-day Jordan, ladies and gentlemen. There's genetic deficiencies that make them antisocial. They are genius in many areas, especially that of finance, computer sciences. Adam Lanza's computer science genius. Could take apart a computer, put it back together again, look at the split. He's a computer genius, but he was antisocial. He had Asperger's syndrome most definitely under some form of mind control, folks. This story is a huge, much, much bigger story behind the story. So we have these controlled newspapers putting out only what they want to create fear. And I tell you, folks, it it's easy to get sucked into this fear paranoia because they know how to play the heartstrings. They're skilled at it. These are Again, CIA operatives know exactly how to put out psyops called psychological operations. 
they know by means of a computer, okay, that that is tied into your social networking, your Facebook and Twitter accounts. They know exactly how to pull the strings. They know exactly how to push your buttons, folks. It's a given. Go to my blog, ladies and gentlemen, and, and read the Stansbury and Associates report that came out about the beast, the computer, the massive CIA computer underground in Virginia, and how this massive network computer can predict trends with 99% accuracy. Read and understand the story of how this is being marketed now to private corporations, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 corporations, so they can predict exactly how they can best line up their merchandising because of trends that are created by the CIA. Are, you got to get a hold of this, folks. I give a, a classic example of a Target store. Target, you know, the the infamous Target store of liberal media attention, Tar-J. How Target store sent out, sends out flyers addressed to people that they've identified as, as far as their social networking trends. They sent one young woman discount coupons and advertisements for newborn baby cribs, newborn baby apparel, newborn baby accoutrements, as if this was an expecting mother. The father of this woman, this young woman who received, you know, got some of these things, uh, was incensed. My daughter is not pregnant. She's not even sexually active. How dare they send these these discount coupons to my daughter? And made a big stink about it. It made a big issue to have uh, demanding they cease and desist such advertising. Only to find out later that the father discovered that the that his daughter was indeed expecting and pregnant. How did Target Stores International know this when the father didn't even know this? The answer is the CIA sharing of data information with big corporations, folks. That's all there in that Stansbury and Associates report. And it's linked on, it's called, the, the, the story behind the story post is the minority report, the future of predictive programming, folks. There's a movie st starring Tom Cruise called Minority Report where Tom Cruise heads up this law enforcement team that consults a super artificial intelligence computer tied to some animated brains of of people who of humans that are prescient they can predict the future with combined with the computer analysis of trends with virtually 99% Accuracy. So, Minority Report is they, 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 these uh, precogs, precognitive impulses spit out a, a report that shows where a crime is going to happen. It has not happened yet, but it's going to happen. So, Tom Cruise's team goes in and, uh, arrests people before the crime even takes place under the auspices of it saving innocent lives. It's saving these poor Sandy Hook victims, these poor little innocent ones like Emily Parker. You see. <laughs> The capital W. 
Science fiction? No, not according to the Stansbury report that this is going to be the the wave of Wall Street in the business of the 21st century. Heaven help us. Because you see, the problem with the minority report scenario is they're taking divine intervention out of the picture. They're de- they're humanizing the actions of humans. You don't think for a minute, folks, that angelic beings may not intervene in some person's life at the last minute. There's been there's many many times people have have been in despair that have been willing all set to to to, to go into a bank or some other business and rob it and shoot it up but divine intervention steps in at the last minute and stops them see that's that one percent the minority reports just don't give credit to the computers you see these cia run computers they can't factor in the divine intervention into the human psyche. It makes it makes humans very unpredictable, this quotient of the soul, this quotient of the spirit. But you see, they want, they, these handlers want the flesh, want the arm of flesh to control all actions and activities, you see. And thus it becomes completely and totally predictable and if it's predictable, they can make a lot of money on it. This is called an event contract. This is the this is the world in which we live today, folks. You track it, trace it back to the controllers, trace it back to the money. You trace it back to a select group of elite Edomites. They call themselves Jews, but are not Jews, but are the synagogue of Satan, and. Uh, Oh, my goodness. I received a phone call Thursday night from a gentleman who I've known for years and years. Gentleman by the last name of Evangelista, Dr. Arthur Evangelista. A, you know, I, I, I don't trust anybody 100% these days. I just, I just try and be careful where I put my foot. There's a, There's a lot of dog manure around the lawn, if you know what I mean, folks. You've got to be careful where you step. So, yes. Dr. Evangelista spent much of his adult life working for the government, the Federal Drug Administration, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration. As an enforcer, ladies and gentlemen, uh, an officer with arrest powers. And he says he got fed up with it because he realized that it was really enforcers paid by Big Pharma to promote and protect special interests. And so he basically left to that life and went uh, and want to get away into a, you know, a s- small rural setting in Montana. So I received a call from, from Dr. Evangelista fr- on Thursday night and wow. He said, you won't believe this because see, when I came out and began to expose the hoax that is the bird flu scam, the pandemic influenza scam, the resurrection, the recombination in the genetic laboratory of the killer 1918 pandemic flu virus. When I began to expose all this, Dr. Evangelista became one of my strong assets and, and supplier of information and verification of everything I was saying. He's incredibly connected still. And he knows he's he's not a he's not a stooge. He's very bright and very educated. And he comes out to me and he says, "Off the blue, he says there's a there's a woman who is leading one of the leading vocal proponents, you know, of anti-vaccination and of exposing Codex Alimentarius." But he sent me a certified 
affidavit signed and notarized that Rima Labau was actually working for Big Pharma and was working as a disinformation agent and trying to undermine the alternative health network. People like my friend John and others who are really honestly trying to do their best to blow the whistle on Codex and the World Health Organization of Edomites that, that really are trying to take away your freedoms. But in every organization, psychological operations written, the Psychops Manual, Psychological Army's Psyops Manual was written by a guy named General Stubblebean, Albert Burt Stubblebean. He wrote the book on Psyops. And the book on Psyops is very clear. He says to have, to have a successful psychological operations, you have to have control opposition. You have to have people on the inside claiming to be part of the revolution, part of the movement. And you've got to have them taking names and infiltrating and destroying. Albert Burt Stubblebean was flat out shall we say, hustled by Rima Labell. She became his concubine. Stubble being put away his wife in divorce, became attached to Rima Labell. And Rima Labell, according to this signed affidavit, the sworn statement is a double agent absolutely coming to the heads of the FDA and trying to, to infiltrate and to destroy the actual movement. And Rima Labell's out there, oh, send me all your money, I'll send you and get you a place in paradise in Panama. Why don't you drink some poison Kool-Aid, ladies and gentlemen, because that's exactly what this woman is, is poison. Talk about this as we come back. And I don't mind telling it like it is, folks. I'm going to tell you, this is unbelievable what I'm going to tell you in the next half hour. Please stay tuned. This is the story behind the story. Don't go away. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the story behind the story. Oh, yeah. So here I get this information from credible information, a sworn affidavit that would be sent to court, can be sent in court about really who Rima Leibau is, and, and it, absolutely. I, I sent her and her attorneys a official notice saying cease and desist. Cease and desist taking money. Fair warning, quit taking money on the auspices that you're fighting against Codex Alimentarius because, you see, that's the very definition of wire fraud. You're taking money from people over the postal and post offices and electronic communications via Visa V credit cards. That's wire fraud. You're fraudulent. You are not fighting against Codex Elementaris. You are promoting it, and you're taking money, lots of money under extremely false pretenses. And I will, I will file a court action against you for this. Well, they did cease and desist. And you never hear too I haven't heard too much about from this this imposter folks. Alex from California knows the story. Other people know the whole story with this. How somehow Rima and uh, you know is hooked up with Len Horowitz, they're they're Edomites by bloodline. They claim to be Jews, but are not Jews, but are really the synagogue of Satan. Their inner circle cons consists of people like, well, Ingo Swan, an infamous figure of MK Ultra programming, folks. Their inner circle is very, very, very questionable, to say the least. CIA, absolutely. Then to top it off, as we were as we were, as I'm working with uh, 
a group named, you know, John Skura, his his friend Dane Phillips, the book that they published, um, something called Battle Him, in telling the story of MK Ultra and mind control programming and satanic ritual abuse as part and parcel of that, introduced them to a CIA presidential model controlled assassin going by the name of Liz. She's been on this story this short story behind the story show and told her story. And as she as was so happened, she was recounting her programming, how she would be ritually abused in these different military installations. And then false memories being implanted, false memories of alien abduction, false memories, you see, tied to the greys and these... It's, it's all false memory. It's not there, but it's there to confuse the real memories of her satanic ritual abuse. And she happens to be watching a video where Rima Labelle pops on. Where it's a Scientology produced video and Rima Labelle pops up as his expert and she freaks out. She says, that's the woman. That's the woman who, pro who came in and programmed me. I remember her. I know her. And it really sent her into a mental tailspin for quite a while. You know, see, where there's, where there's smoke, ladies and gentlemen, there's hellfire. All right? So Dr. Evangelista calls me and says, you're not going to believe this. Rima Labau just published a video, publicly published a video, where she looks into the camera and declares, I am Adam Lanza's doctor. And then she goes on to explain how... She got Adam Lanza off his meds, his terrible, mind-numbing medications. And then how she held Adam Lanza's mother, Nancy, in her hands. Hold her in her arms to comfort her, for her son has been so abused. I am Adam Lanza's doctor. She bald-faced lies in front of the camera. Now, I say lies because it all sounds convincing that she is this, she's this, the only psychiatrist, medical doctor, trained in psychiatry, who was fighting this evil pharmaceutical mess of, of antidepressants, SSRI. She is the one that drug-free psychiatry, yippee that's me. I am Adam Lanza's doctor. I kid you not, folks. This video it may stand. I don't know if it's going to be taken off of YouTube. It probably will, based, you know, based on. I mean, this is this is incredible, because you don't know that she's lying until you watch the tail end of the video where the disclaimer pops up. There's a disclaimer. I she is not really Adam Lanza's doctor. My God! Then what else is she lying about on the video? And then I get a... Some people email me. You really don't get it. You're just so stupid. She's just using this, this as, as an example. She's not being literal. It's much deeper than that. She's telling everybody... That she is the savior, you know. She, I mean, come on, no, no. It's in at the very least is an extremely poor taste. Extremely poor. You want to use a parable? Do it in a different form. You don't sit, come up and and make these outlandish claims that you're. I am his doctor. Let me tell you something, folks. MK Ultra 
they experiment with LSD and experiment in ways to, to, to manipulate the human brain. And what came out of the, uh, according to the, the declassified documents on MKUltra that I have personally studied, is that they kind of quit using psychiatric drugs like LSD to fragment people's minds because it damaged the minds. What Rima Leibau was talking about on this video, what she's really saying to me, who, who have, I mean, I've studied this for 25 years, folks, what she's really saying to me is that we use neurolinguistics, we use hypnosis, we use satanic ritual abuse to control the minds. We don't need drugs. Drugs are bad for our group. We practice the craft. I practice the craft. What craft? Since when is psychiatry referred to as a craft? No, Satanism is the craft, ladies and gentlemen. And she just flat out exposes herself in this video. I've been practicing the craft for 45 years. What craft? You've only been a psych licensed psychiatrist for a couple decades. What craft have you been practicing for over 40 plus years? My goodness. You see, the history of MK Ultra goes back 40 plus years, and it's the craft, you see, of taking young children, splitting their personality into altars which they control. They have their designated CIA and military handlers, ladies and gentlemen, people like Alexander and others of Las Vegas and PSYOP, PSYTECH, P-S-I-T-E-C-H, PSYTECH. Do your homework and you just see who these people are. These are the people you see that Ted Gunderson was trying his best, his level best, with the human, he's, he's flesh and blood, he's one man. Ted Gunderson was doing his best to try and expose and to get law enforcement to understand the seriousness and depth of the problem. The Satanism going on in daycares, daycare centers and other places. The Satanism going on, going on under the cover of Christian religion, folks. I spent significant time with Ted Gunderson towards the tail end of his life, folks. He came to Ogden when he was suffering with cancer. Not well, but gave 72 hours, three days of his life to opening up his files. I looked deep into his eyes, his soul, and saw the manly tears. You didn't want to tell... A strong man, when he cries and sobs, not, not doing so as an act of publicity of a show, because it was just me and him. And when a strong man breaks down and cries, because he realizes that the... the to his mind, the, the the incredible power block that these, he said, it's it's the Jews, it's the it's these people, it's this tribe. They control it. Whether it's the Mormon Church, which says really what my what it all boils down to is this group of extremely powerful Jews. He says I pray to I says for what is what good it will do. I says I pray to God that He intercedes and stops this insanity, these, the massacring of these little innocent ones. And you have Leonard Horowitz and Sherry Kane and others coming out and libeling and slandering Ted Gunderson and myself for just simply trying to expose the satanic covens of Rima Leibow and others like Len Horowitz. It's very serious business, folks absolutely as serious as it can get. It's not conspiracy theory. It's science. It's fact. It's truth. I told Ted 
Gunderson, face to face, in my home here in Ogden, Utah. I said, Ted, but we only have one life to give for the truth. Patrick Henry said it best. I only wish I had more than one life to give for liberty. Give me liberty or give me death. We have only one life to live. We can only really be Christian disciples. And there's no better way to to honor Christ in my mind than to attempt at least do the best you can to expose the evil. Expose his enemies. Expose those who would... hurt the little ones, the innocent ones, who would offend the little ones. That's what I do, folks. That's why I do a radio show. We don't have millions of listeners. We have very small listening audiences Christmas Eve, but that's my Christmas Eve message. There is a select group of elitists They call themselves Jews, but they are not Jews. They are the synagogue of Satan, and Satan is their God. Satan is their Lord, Lucifer, the fallen angel. For that is who they worship in their temples. Mormon temples are that. Jewish synagogues, for the most part, is where this is honored. Because, you see, that is who controls them. Now, that doesn't mean that the people, the average person, the average Un, n- n- ignorant, unknowledgeable person that goes in innocently to the synagogues is guilty. That's not at all the truth here. They are ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. The vast majority of good Mormon people just don't understand. They don't see it. Their minds are veiled. Does that make them evil people? No, I don't believe that for a minute. It just means they're they're dupes or hypnotized. It means they're used as patsies, just like Lee Harvey Oswald was used as a patsy. Makes them a victim. At least in my mind, it makes, makes them a class to be pitied. sad. It's tragic. The millions of people are hypnotized and duped by demonic entities, by lying spirits. So with that, I just want to expose really the power behind Christmas, this Christmas Eve. This is again uh, 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 (laughs) In yesterday's paper, Sunday, December 23rd, the Salt Lake Tribune, the news media organ controlled by the synagogue of Satan out of Goldman Sachs, ultimately, right? They have, in in their section of the Sunday paper called The Mix, Cool Yule, Cool Yule, Y-U-L-E. Cool Yule. And they have a a close up picture of a of a of a pagan's belt buckle of a pentagram with an up point pointing up star. Cool Yule. Woohoo! Celebrate Yule, ladies and gentlemen. The five points of the highest black Sabbath of the Satanist cults. Now I'm not saying this pagan they interviewed this character is a satanist he may just be duped like the good mormons that uh, or his neighbors are as well but the fact is the highest levels of paganism the highest levels of witchcraft the highest levels of freemasonry folks they're controlled by the synagogue of satan these these who have made their blood commitment to the fallen Lord Satan. And these people, folks, they perform human sacrifices on a regular basis. 
The highest Black Sabbath where human sacrifices are issued is September, I'm sorry, December 21st, the cusp of the five-day celebration of the Yule. It's called Cool Yule. This writer, Ben Fulton, I, I've met Ben Fulton. He, he, he's really surprised he would write such a thing. The belt buckle, this pentagram belt buckle, this is the caption underneath, quote, a pagan pentagram adorns the belt of Andwin Lay, a high priest in a British-style coven of druids and Wiccan witches who has been leading his, his congregants through the high holy days of Yule. Lives in Sandy, Utah, ladies and gentlemen. The high holy days. He's a high priest. A high priest, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, a high priest out of, after the order of Melchizedek. That is witchcraft. That is the wizards. That's the paganism. Now, they call themselves druids, and they say that goes back anciently to England. Folks, that's a big, big lie. Anciently, the druids of of Ireland, the Druids of Scotland, the Druids of Stonehenge. They're not Wicca. They're Israel, ladies and gentlemen, true Israel. And they built ancient astronomy temples like Stonehenge to map the star charts, which they were expert at, folks. They had high, high-level universities in prehistoric England, folks. The memory of which is completely lost from the earth by design. High-level mathematics, trigonometry, geometry, Pythagorean theorems, ladies and gentlemen. They knew. They knew the true history of this earth. They knew the true origins of our very DNA. The mysteries they taught have long been long been lost. So these these pagans today, these Wiccans, yes, the Satanists, ladies and gentlemen, they want you to believe this is the ancient old religion. So this this story in the Salt Lake Tribune is again more of the same. And let me just again explain to you the, the movement. It's all ec ecumenicalism. It's all well pagans and Jews and Mormons and Catholics. We're all the same. We've got to all unite. This is what the movement's all about. Ecumenicalism. And they unite again in in a trend to, def to actually defy Yeshua, defy the truth of the saving grace of Christ. And this is what it's all about. It's a uniform uniformity to obfuscate the saving grace, the gospel of, save, of salvation of Jesus Christ. That's what it's really all about, folks. Here's a story written by Ben Filton. I've got I to gotta share this with you and going into the top of the hour. Because this is really where, where the rubber meets the road. The story behind the story of today, the 24th day of December. Dateline, Santa Utah. And when Lay smiles lovingly on the small green tree lit with bulbs in his living room. The mistletoe is at the ready in a nearby pot. A freshly bought duck nestled in potatoes rose away in the kitchen oven. But the 42-year-old former television producer, get that, television producer, isn't celebrating Christmas. No, no. As a high priest who oversees what he refers to as a British-style coven, Lay is deep in the mystic 
realm of what pagans call Yule, Y-U-L-E, Yule. The celebration is all about light, or the lack thereof, as the Earth's axis relative to the sun changes height above the equator. To give those who live in the Northern Hemisphere a December solstice. Daylight recedes as the nights grow colder and longer. What the pagan Yule refers to as the five dark days culminate on the top of the Yule, the five, the top of the pentagram, folks. December 21st, the darkest day of all. Ever heard of the five days of Christmas, have you, for the five days of Yule? We'll explain this to you, ladies and gentlemen, and tell you exactly how this ties into Mormonism. The top of the hour. We'll do America in Jeopardy. Indeed, we will come back. Thanks for listening. This is the story behind the story. Stay tuned. Oh, wait a minute. I went on a mute button here. I'm sorry. Oh, welcome back to the second hour of the story behind the story, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh, yes, Jeopardy. Shelby, you're not listening to my broadcast. You would have heard that I said we'll be back with Jeopardy. Yes, we're doing Jeopardy, Shelby. Indeed, we are. Okay, here's the America in Jeopardy question. Let's get this out there because I want to really fold this discussion into this. Revered by millions of people as the prophet to restore the true church of Jesus Christ of the earth. This Wiccan wizard was born on the cusp, what's called the cusp of the Yule Pagan celebration, December 23rd. That's the answer. The question is, who was Joseph Smith, Jr.? Yes, his birthday was yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, December 23rd. And Mormons uh, that uh, really think he's some, some, some incredibly great, powerful restorer of Gospels, they honor him in much the same way that many Christians honor Christ. They, oh, wow, he's, this is his birthday, and we celebrate it along with Christ two, two days later, Christ's birthday on the 25th. That's significant, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you, the, the fact that Christ was not born on December 25th is, is very significant. You don't think for one minute that that's a phony date. You don't understand history, folks. The decree of Caesar Augustus that all the world was, should be taxed occurred in the springtime. Folks, that's documented by historians all over the world that really understand. Livestock are not grazing in the hills around Bethlehem on, in the winter months of December. Keep in mind that Israel's still in that northern hemisphere. It's not going to be a good time to have animals out when it's cold and Nothing is growing. They harvest feedstocks for the animals. They feed them inside where they're sheltered. There are no shepherds abiding their flocks in the field, folks, in December 25th. There's, there's debates exactly when the date of birth, date of crisis. And I don't think it really matters other than the time of the, you know, the year. And in fact, it happened. That's important. But the specific birth date, some people say it's actually September 11th of the year 03 AD. And it could be, could possibly be. I'm not discounting that research. But I, what I am discounting is the, the pagan Satanism of the Catholic fathers, the Edomite Catholics who declared to the world that December 25th was the birth date of our Lord and Savior. They're not true. Absolutely not true. And it's got pagan origins. Now, let me explain to you why. Now, this, this half-truth article in the Salt Lake Tribune, I say half-truth because a lot of what they're saying is accurate, but they don't tell the whole rest of the story as to how it came to be, see? They're calling it a cool Yule, right? 
We took off at the at the break. The pagan you know, refers the pagan cultists, the occultists. They call it the five dark days of Yule. Five days celebration of Yule. See, there's a the pentagram of the pagans, the Satanists. They, we'll call it what it is. The it's the it's those who worship Satan. I don't care, folks, if I offend people. I'm past that. It's a satanic pentagram. Their five points of the pentagram correspond with the five dark days of Yule. On the with the pentagram with the point facing up the star, the five pointed star, they have dates associated with that. They have they have different cusps. The top of the pentagram in their calendar, their date of celebration is December twenty first. The winter solstice, the darkest day of all, the darkest day of the year. Does it just, don't you see, ladies and gentlemen, why these Satanists, these Rosicrucians would put out that December 21st is the day where the world will end? It's their dark day. It's their day of high Black Sabbath. Because you see, they want people's psyche to think about it. Because as you think about it, it empowers their dark energies. It truly does. December 21st, the darkest day of all. The day where the sun is the short. It's the shortest day of the year. The sun is at its lowest point in the horizon. And now it begins to make its track back. The days get longer until June 21st, the summer solstice the longest day of the year. See, all of these are celebrations. On the summer solstice, the pentagram is inverted. There's five days of celebration on Midsummer's Day. The summer solstice, folks, there's five days culminating with the pentagram on the uh, inverted, which is the, the, the dark Again, more ritual ceremonies and sacrifices of humans, preferably blue-eyed blondes from the true house of Israel. That's who they really love to sacrifice for their offering to the serpent, the god Satan. Now, that's just, that's just the way it is, folks. This story behind the story today is going to be hard-hitting, Sunday, December. Monday, December 24th, is based on Sunday, December 23rd, greatly timed, fifth day of the pagan Yule, the Yule celebration. Let me explain to you now what this goes on and says. Pagan Yule ceremonies are suffused in light and darkness as spiritual metaphors that carry deep personal significance in relation to the cycles of earth and nature, Lay said, this high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Does that ring any bells to those good Mormon people listening to the show? If any, the article quotes, and I quote, his sandy house, Lay's sandy house, is a jumble of symbols important to his religious practice. Indeed, symbolism is important to the Satanist and to the pagan. Very important because it's uh, it's an icon, it's an, an idol that they use to invoke the presence of their deity, their demon entities, folks. You've got to understand this. The Sandy House is a jumble of symbols important to his religious practice. Most of them reside in a small temple he maintains in a downstairs room. I just bet you. This time of year, one symbol is elevated almost above all. Mistletoe is very important to us, he said. It's the seed of God cut from the sacred tree once a year as a symbol of the return of the child of light. Mm -hmm. 
Illuminati, light, ladies and gentlemen, the child of light is the return of Lucifer, the god of the east. Lucifer, the light bearer. Lucifer literally means the bearer of light, the child of light. Quote, if that sounds familiar to Christian ears, it ought to. In the centuries before Christianity swept through northern and central Europe, pre-Christian societies marked the darkest day of the year and the coming return of light with feasts and the burning of a Yule log. Pines, holly, mistletoe, and other plant life that retained green color throughout the dark days were honored. Now, they, these were pre-Christians because, you see, in these countries, specifically Great Britain, Britannia, in Ireland, and the Gallic traditions, they, they understood the prophecies 200 years before he was born. They understood the prophecies of the coming Messiah, Yeshua. But you see, in the pagan tradition, the child of light is not Jesus Christ. It didn't. He is not the Messiah. He's an imposter. He's a phony. They're looking for the return of, of Lucifer to their king, to their as the king, to control and rule this earth in a new world order, folks. Okay, for a time in England, as Puritanism surged under Cromwell's rule. All such pagan accoutrements were banned as unchristian. Now, get this. Puritanism, that, that is a half-truth. Puritanism, if you look at the, if you really study what happened under Cromwell and the forces of Crom Cromwell brought back the Jews which were kicked out of, uh, out of England. Cromwell brought back the Rothschild, House of Rothschild in the city of London. Cromwell was the agent of the ousted banksters of Edom. And Puritanism, you see, according to none other than King James, Puritanism is demonology, witchcraft, hexes, and worship of the Dark Lord. This is in the book Demonology put out by King James. You know, King James that brought us the King James Holy Bible. No, he banned paganism, ladies and gentlemen. King James banned paganism. And it wasn't it wasn't Puritanism under Cromwell. No, no, no. That's all a smokescreen. Quote, the return to the old symbols was gradual, but eventually so complete that today most of us never give the pagan roots of Christmas decorations a second thought. This high priest, Andwin Lay, said, quote, if most people knew just how pagan their religion was, they'd freak, <laughs> Lay said. Mm-hmm. Oh, goodly. Okay, he, he diverts uh, the story away from really the story of the pagan religion of Andwin Lay. It goes back in to art, you know, artful expressions. What's going on? Uh, you know, they're 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 showing the. Sun routes and in, in, in art and in tunnels, sun tunnels, Nancy Holt sun tunnels. Oh, it's all that doesn't doesn't mean a whole lot as far as religion. It's just art expression. But here is here is what how it's, they tie it back into the pagan Satanism of the pentagram. Mother goddesses quote mother goddesses whose 
king hyphen son was born at winter solstice for the benefit of full humanity are icons in pagan cultures. Now, that's a, an important clue, folks. When, you, when you're born under the cusp, on the cusp, what they call the cusp of the Yule, cusp of the Yule is the terminology, it's, it's cusp means on the tail end or the front side of the pentagram. You're a king hyphen son in this devilry of these this high black art of wizardry folks of casting spells with a hexagram and flat out worshiping the fallen angel Lucifer you're given extreme importance in these satanic cults if your birthday falls on the cusp of the Yule celebration Joseph Smith being born on December 23rd makes him a very special king's son in satanic covens in fact folks in fact in the synagogue of Satan who again ignore and obfuscate and try and destroy Christians whether they're Armenian or whether they're Russian or whether they're Eastern European, they want to destroy Christianity and Christians. This synagogue of Satan has their own prophecy of a returning Messiah king, a king's son, a son god, folks, S-U-N. They tell of, they prophesy of a ben Berechiah, a great, a great prophet, who would precede the way from the sun god, Lucifer's appearance to rule and reign. He would set the way, set in motion the restoration of all things for their sun god, Lucifer, to appear to rule the world. Ben Berechiah Judah, his name would be Joseph, ladies and gentlemen. He would be the son of Joseph, and he would be born on the cusp of the Yule, the day when light would come back to the earth, December 23rd, not December 25th, December 23rd, is the Ben Berakiah Joseph legends and myths and prophecies of the Cabal, the Kabbalah, ladies and gentlemen. Joseph Smith, you see, was much more Edomite Jewish than he was Christian, by far and away more. And indeed, Joseph Smith Jr. restored the high priesthood of Lucifer back to the earth and established the pagan high centers of worship, the Mormon temples. You see, here in this picture, is in the, uh, these pictures of the symbols of, of Andwin Lay, the high priest, high priest of the coven of 13 13 in a coven ladies and gentlemen coven of 13 druids and so called wiccan wizards there's a picture of him with this pentagon pentagram over his doorway is this iconic symbol of the all seeing eye The all-seeing eye. Never mind that the same exact icon is graved in stone all over the Salt Lake City Mormon temple. Never mind that the pentagon, the pentagram, is all over the Salt Lake City temple. Never mind that it's even on the Eagle Gate of Salt Lake City. Never mind that in the Temple Square statue of the Christus, the Christ statue, that the pentagon, this pentagram, symbol of magic, symbol of satanic power, is carved in the wood all around the Christus. Now you wonder, 
why it is that Gordon Bittner Hinckley, prophet of Mormonism, declared, indeed publicly declared that the Christ of the Mormons is a different Christ than the biblical Christ worshipped by the Christians. For their God is Lucifer, ladies and gentlemen, their God is the fallen angel, the enemy of the creator God, the triune God, the eternal father, Emmanuel, God with us, born of a virgin in a manger in Bethlehem. That's the reality. That's the truth, folks. That's the fact. And so there's an ecumenical movement between false prophets, false priests, whether they're evangelical Christians like John Hagee and Billy Graham. They're, they're, the ecumenical movement is simply saying we're not any different than our brothers in Mormonism. We're not any different than our brethren in the Catholic faith, which is dominated by Edomite Jesuits, ladies and gentlemen. We're no different, you see, than our little brother, Anduin Lay, the pagan high priest. We're no different because we're all worshiping pagan idols. And they're not lying in that declaration. There is no difference. They're all being duped by the demon of courts, the imps the familiar spirits, the lying spirits that walk the earth, folks. So, today, December 24th, 2012, it's going to be worshipped as Christmas Eve by Christians all across the country, but please understand, It's set up just like Sunday is set up by the Vatican as the day to worship the sun god bow. And understand that the only true religion is your heart connection to Jesus of Nazareth, the true God of the universe. And the path is rocky. The path is narrow. The path is very, very hard to find. It's not broad and wide, and there's not... Millions and millions of people walking the straight, narrow, hidden path of truth to Christ. Very few people have it. Very few people find it. Broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Christ himself taught that, folks. Broad is the way and wide is the gate. Many, many people are on that trail. Many good Mormons are on that trail, including my beloved family members, my siblings. I know it. I see it. I know the difference because I've seen both. The imposter, I've, I have felt the familiar spirit of the Book of Mormon. See, the Book of Mormon is clearly governed by a familiar spirit. But you see, it took really understanding the Holy Bible, understanding the book of Kings and the books of Samuel, understand that a familiar spirit is a demonic entity, folks, a lying spirit governed by the fallen angel. Can a familiar spirit cause an emotional response? Absolutely. Most definitely it can. I know. I have felt it myself. But that familiar spirit comes and goes. It waxes and wanes. As you obey the law of the fallen angel Lucifer, as you obey the edicts of his church arm of flesh leaders, as you obey, you're going to get that familiar spirit more and more common. But it's an absolute false imposter compared to the Comforter, which is Jesus Christ. Boy, I felt the difference. There is no comparison between the born-again Comforter entering your heart, the truth of Jesus Christ being manifest. There's no difference. There is such an incredible 
such an incredible difference between familiar spirit whisperings and the comforter. It's night and day. There is no difference, ladies and gentlemen, with Jesus Christ and the comforter, for they are one and the same. They are indeed three in one. People ask me all the time, well, yeah, you know, how can you, how can you believe in the tri- triune God, the, the three in one? Uh, excuse me? Really, you don't understand quantum physics. God the Father, the creator of all, you see, think he can't come down and be, be bathed in flesh? It still exists as a force in the universe and still have his only begotten son in the flesh being himself? The term the only begotten means he is the only one that's, that, is, that is God the creator. And as Christ broke the bands of death and offered those who truly believe on him eternal life, as he broke the bands of death, he said, I'll give you a special gift, the comforter, which is himself, which is him, in another form. The comforter will come and dwell in your heart and never leave you if you're truly born again. Ah, the wise Pharisee, Nicodemus, the wise man, the the deep philosopher of the Sanhedrin came to Christ and says, how can this be? How can a man reenter the womb of his mother and be born again? You say, Rabbi teacher, you say that a man must be born again? How can this be? See, his his heart and his ears and his eyes weren't were still veiled. How can it be? You see, you didn't understand the power of the Creator, the power of Christ. That when the Comforter, when the true Holy Ghost, the true Spirit, the true essence of Jesus Christ enters the heart of mankind, that a literal change is made in the DNA structure of the human being. Uh, Paul understood this on the road to Damascus. It happened to him. He understood that, wow, the mystery is that when when the Comforter, when Christ, when, him, when Christ as the Holy Ghost, when Christ as the Comforter enters your heart, it makes you a new creature. It You have a re- new rebirth, a literal wham, change in your DNA. That's the, that's the incredible power and mystery of godliness, the glory of God. And when that DNA change occurs, you see you become part of a, an incredible family. And the wonderful thing is this, this powerful change in DNA can happen to everybody and anybody. It doesn't have to be limited to the house, the true house of Israel. Those of you listening that are that are Christian identity members, listen up. It can happen to a man of African American Negro descent. It can happen to our brethren, the Jews too, the, the synagogue of Satan members. It can happen to anybody and everybody if they open their hearts truly to the truth of Jesus Christ. That DNA change makes you a new creature. That's the fact. And if you want to say otherwise, you're part of the problem. Got to go. We're going to take a break. Come back with the final segment of today's story behind the story. Please stay tuned. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back once again to the final segment of today's uh, story behind the story, the 24th day of December. We do have a caller online from the great state of North Carolina. We have Don on the line. Don, are you still there? Yes, I am. I have something that was just too good not to share. Thank you. Please share. All right. You know how everybody's talking about the Judaization of America? Uh Uh-huh. Okay. I went to the post office a couple of days ago to get one stamp for a letter I needed to mail. The only single stamps they had were Hanukkah stamps. Now, we're talking less than a week before Christmas, not a Christmas tree, not a cross, not jingle bells, nothing 
All they had was Hanukkah. Hanukkah was over. And I just, you know, I just thought that was outrageous. Wow. <laughs> well, are you really surprised, though, Don? No, I wasn't, but I still thought it was outrageous. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, uh, just in the in the newspaper today, this uh, uh, Obama's nominee for uh, the the Secretary of Defense is they're saying now he's not going to be be uh, given the post because he got, he can't have enough votes. Why? Because APAC came out and said, look, no, he's not qualified. This 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 Mr. Hagee, right. he's and he's not qualified. Why? Because. He doesn't. Uh, he's not really strong on sanctions against Iran. You know, he's he's a, more of a moderate. See, since when is APAC, you know, declaring who can be Secretary of Defense? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think they decide all the rest of the posts. So why not that? Absolutely, absolutely. And 2013 coming up. My goodness, what a. You know, unless and until we and I say the people that are really are awake. Uh, start exposing who really is behind the scenes here, who really is APAC, who really is uh, Israel. I, we're in trouble. And I and well, I guess it's not... A, you well, you know, know one of the just... problems is Christians, Christ, Christianity teaches people to be good-hearted. I mean, that's kind of the, the whole bed, bedrock of the religion. And most Christians can't even... I mean, they never learn anything about Judaism. And they think everybody's like Christians. They just have a menorah, right? And they do not realize the depth of... Uh, differentness, we might say, in that religion. But, you know, Jews come in, they run Christian institutions, they study Christianity, they write books, they define the religion. But how many Christians really get into synagogues and learn Judaism? Less than 1%, I'd guess. You're right. You're they don't know what right they're dealing that. with. They have no idea. And look, you, uh, this just reminded me of something else. We have a new governor. He's a Republican governor. I happen to vote Republican. His name is Pat McCrory. But I'll tell you what really aided me during the uh, campaign. He had a he had a um, commercial that ran, and he says we're going to treat our patrons like their customers. And I wanted to say we're your owners, buddy. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> there's this whole mind control game, and he kept talking about how we're going to treat you know we're going to treat uh, North Carolinians like customers. No, you're not going to treat us like customers. We are the owners of this government. And, you know, they still have that mercantile mentality, and most people wouldn't even stop twice to think about what he was really saying. Good point. It's, it's again, controlled by the media at large. I, I, guess, I don't know if you heard the first part of my, my story today about media news and how they control so much. You just have to do a little bit of digging to see who really is at the top control board of this thing. And, yeah. and hello. As a as a nation thinks, so are we. Okay, yeah. they understand that truth, and they sure control us. Yep. So, well, well they said. Write the book. Well said. You know, they they you know, I mean, Jews are smart. I mean, they didn't get what they are by being stupid, but they target every area. They control everything: medicine, publishing, law, politics, everything. And like I say, Christians are just too. They, I don't want to call them simple, but they are kind of. Guile. They're guileless. You know, they're, they're simple-minded and simple-hearted because they think that's purity. But they need to wake up, and they need to do their homework, and they need to pick up the, I won't say pick up the sword, but they need to really wise up. Well, it's, it's coming to that. I really do think that, you know, the people know there's a there's a smelly herring somewhere in the woodpile, okay? They know there's something stinky. And so one by one, we try and, and point out exactly what's going on, the agenda, why it is. The, the, uh, you know, my, my series of, uh, of exposés called The Righteous Blood hopefully has helped people uh, awaken to that a little bit. I, it, it's, uh, what the agenda to me has is, is got to be one of education. But then, you know, the, the big problem, Don, is really they... They have the the weapons of mass destruction ready and poised to bring destruction down if too many people wake up. That's the other problem. But I've had this discussion I, I, with. I, you know, I, I agree with you, and it does seem terrible. And we've got to keep our guns. I mean, if we lose the guns, the game is over. However, there are some reports coming out of Iran that they are actually marketing free energy devices, and there are a lot of ideas that maybe Iran is onto a new technology. And that's why America's making such a big fuss about them having nuclear weapons. They may have gone the next step. I mean, we are moving into a different era, and some of these things are going to be as passe as the Model T. And I'm not so sure help may not come 
from an interesting direction when we need it. I, I'm, I'm just not so sure that that might not be the case. Yeah, you're right. The, the hope that we have as Christians, really true hope, is, again, studying, studying the Holy Writ. Because you know what? The, the entire agenda is there. It, it, it truly is. If you really understand biblical prophecy, yeah. you know, these guys have power, and it seems hopeless. But, you know, they are, they are little small ants compared to the, the boot the that is Jesus Christ. Okay? Absolutely. Well, listen, happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you, Todd. Thanks for calling in. You're right okay. on point. Thanks for sharing with that. Yeah, going into a, to, to the United States Post Office, the USPO, wanted to get a single stamp, and the only stamp that's there is celebrating Hanukkah, which is, of course, um, over now. Folks, let me just spend the rest of the this Christmas Eve broadcast again pointing out to you that it doesn't matter the date of his birth. It just what really matters is he is he in your heart? Is he in your very soul? Is your DNA actually changed and become born again? That's the question I'm I'm just uh, uh, sharing with you today. So yeah, today Christmas Eve, my family is all around me personally. We'll go to a, a little celebration at our local Christian church tonight and understand that it's not the date that's important. It's the king that's important. And so we take the time. It's a good time, as, as any, to, to, to bless ourselves with light of truth, to, again, ex, you know, say that the darkness is not going to continue. There is hope on the horizon. The, you know, the, the song, Whispering Hope, I, I love this song. I posted uh, a couple of verses that I wrote, adding on to that, actually, two other verses to the song Whispering Hope, because Christ is our hope. Christ is our anchor. Christ is the eternal king, ladies and gentlemen. And until we <laughs> focus on him, and there is no hope. We are in darkness. We are lost and stumbling around, bumping into walls and making our head all bumpy and bruised. You've got to focus on him as hope. He's the hope of Israel, true Israel and hope of the world. Now I want to just share with you, I had a, a, a format here put out. There's nine, nine points I want to make in Scripture that will help maybe help you understand this. First point, you go back uh, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 26, and you read there about the great flood survivor, the man named Noah. He had three racial branches of mankind, really, his three sons, the three racial branches that, that came out after the Tower of Babel. Their languages were, con were confounded, and also study is now showing that their genetics were altered, too, and they became racial, different racial forms. When you confuse the language, you confuse also, you change the DNA. The descendants of the Noah son Shem, according to Genesis 9.26, the Lord would come out of Shem, the Lord, the Savior, the Messiah, Yeshua. Second point, too. Out of the loins of Shem, Shemites, with the descendants out of Abraham. This is Genesis 22, verse 18. This is the promise of God in the Holy Bible. The one to bless the nations is descendant of the Semite, Abraham. And the point number three, Genesis chapter 26, of Abraham's two sons, the Messiah, the power, the king, Emmanuel, God with us, will come from the seed of Isaac. Point four, now Isaac's children, the Messiah, Yeshua, will appear through the seed of Jacob, Genesis chapter 28, 13 and 14. So the prophecies there of the Bible still narrow it further. Out of Jacob's 12 sons, there were six sons of Leah, right? Two sons of Rachel and four sons out of handmaidens. And there's a Okay, that's the 12 tribes. Out of the 12 sons of Jacob, the deliverer, the promised one, the Messiah, we're born in the tribe of Judah. We find this in Genesis 49, 
verses 8 through 11. This is the Torah, ladies and gentlemen. This is the books, book of Moses, the, the, five, the five books of the Pentateuch. Verse 6, of all the families in Judah, according to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 and 10, he will appear through the family line of Jesse. Now, Jesse, you see, had eight sons that we know of. But in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6, and 2 Samuel chapter 7, it's clearly told and foretold that the Messiah, the Deliverer, Emmanuel, eliminates all the eight sons of Jesse but one, and that is David. David, the little shepherd boy with the stone at age 12, they, they believe at age 12, maybe 13, he went out and slew a Goliath of Gant. David, the house of David out of Bethlehem, ladies and gentlemen. And this is the next point. He must, he will be born. All of ancient prophets foretold they would be born in Bethlehem. And a particular Bethlehem, folks, at that. Remember, you got to know there's two Bethlehems in Judea. There was Bethlehem of Zebulon, 70 miles to the north of Galilee in the area of Nazareth. But this was not where, this, where the promised Messiah would be born. No, the prophesied place was specifically Bethlehem, also known as Ephrata in Judah. This is the prophecy of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. O little town of Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrata. Now the clue, the biggest clue of all is when. See, this is what's what's missing in the discussion when we talk about paganism, when we talk about the synagogue of Satan, when we talk about these Jews who say they are Jews but are not, but are of uh, the Illuminati, the destructive force, really, of the world. Malachi, at 440 B.C., declares in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord, this is in reference again to the Deliverer, the Messiah, the Promised One. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And when, when Malachi wrote these words, folks, the first temple was already destroyed. So he had, you have to understand in time frame, this prophecy relates to the second temple that had to be rebuilt. rebuilt. And so it would say that the Messiah will appear in his temple suddenly as a young lad and would confound the wise men. So this would happen, happen before the second Jewish temple would be destroyed and the destruction under Titus and Roman Legion in 7 AD. It had to happen before then. The Jews of the time, they, millions were killed there, a million two were killed in that in that destruction of Titus. The Edomites, the scribes and Pharisees, the allies of Rome, were taken back to Rome with Bernice becoming the, the queen. Bernice, the daughter of King Herod Agrippa, became the empress under Titus. Tells you a lot right there, folks. The only remnants of Israel were the ones that had left the Holy Land in it and went to the north. Who were they? The six sons, the six kings of of Jacob under Leah. These six kings went northward, folks, and became the six kings, the Vikings of the Northland. Now, the second Jewish temple was still standing when Christ came, and the only time for him it could possibly be according to the words of Isaiah, the scrolls of Isaiah, of Haggai, Daniel, and even in Genesis, it's all there. The only, the only fit that could possibly be is Jesus of Nazareth. Incredible. It's all there. The time frame is definitely there. And why Bethlehem? You say that Sunday, yesterday, we had a great discussion of this in in our little non-denominational church, the 
Main Street Church of Brigham City, Utah. Had a great discussion, and you can go actually go and 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 follow the PowerPoint on this. Uh, just just Google in Main Street Church, Brigham City, Utah. There, all of uh, Jim Catlin's presentations are categorized and put in on YouTube. It's right there. You can actually find them and listen to that. It's a great great analysis of why Bethlehem. Why? There's many other places in in Judea that this promised Messiah could come forth, this Emmanuel, this God incarnate, God the Creator taking human flesh. Why Bethlehems, you see? Oh, the story of Judges, the story the story of Rachel. Rachel, you know, <laughs> good golly, Jacob happened to work an extra seven years, a total of 14 years. He was bamboozled by Laban by taking Leah, as was, you know, thought it was Rachel, his love of his life. And he basically worked as an indentured servant to Laban for 14 years. But Rachel was his love, was his true love. And she died, ladies and gentlemen, in Bethlehem time of great sorrow in the house of Jacob, his beloved Rachel. There was two sons, of course. Two sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. Now, Benjamin, you know, he, was, he wasn't sold into Egypt by his jealous brothers. No, he was, uh, he stayed right there in Bethlehem. Stayed, stayed right there in Bethlehem of Frada. The Benjamites became quite um, dispossessed. According to the books of Judges, chapters 19 through 21. Oh, good golly. The Benjamites, many of them became affiliated with Baal. Baal, they became sons of Belial, sons of perdition, sons of the evil one, folks to the point where the Levite priest coming through with this new wife is, is journeying back to Nazareth, passing through, staying, just staying within Bethlehem, Ephrata, and the, the incredible story where the sons of Belial, these Benjamites who had embraced Baal, came and wanted to have sex with this stranger, this Levite priest, wanted to know him in the biblical sense. And the old man, the resident of the house, bargained with him and said, look, take, don't take my guest, don't take the man, take his property, which of course was a woman. And they had their way with her in a gang rape style of, of from from that hour which was late in the night till the break of dawn and to the point where it absolutely killed her. Wow. The the ensuing the ensuing heartbreak, the eleven other tribes of Israel came against Benjamin and uh Dagon nearly eliminated the whole tribe, except for a few that hid in the rocks. But Benjamin still survived the travail. Why Bethlehem? This place of cursing, place of sorrow. Rachel dies and is buried there. And Benjamin, the Benjamites create this this whoredom, this atrocity, this homosexuality of the same type that ran into Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, folks. What is the why why Bethlehem to be the birthplace of the stem of Jesse, the lineage you see of Judah? Well, David, you see, the the one would bring salvation. If there wasn't a hero out of out of Bethlehem, David, the lineage of David coming out, you see, to champion 
The, the small, the weak, came out and destroyed this Goliath of Gad. Nine feet, over nine feet tall, ladies and gentlemen, over six feet broad at the shoulders. Wow. Little David. The psalmist. Folks, there it is. Out of the line of David, you see Bethlehem. Bethlehem became a place where it was full of despair of Jacob. It became the place of hope, the ray of hope. And Christ being born, whether it's, whether it's celebrated on the 25th of December or the 4th of September, it doesn't matter when. The fact is it happened. this day of the cusp of the end of the rule of the five-pointed star of Yule of the Satanists is as good a time as any to bring the the light of truth of Jesus to the masses. So we do celebrate it as good a time as any. He did appear. The angels came and talked to the shepherds. They were the ones that they ministered to, the shepherds in the fields, folks. There were a lot of other professions that the angels could have come. But why the shepherds? Why the meek and the lowly? Why? David, you see, of Bethlehem was a shepherd boy himself. And Christ is the good shepherd. And we are a sheep. We're naive and we're gullible. We really don't know much about it. And we, there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing out there, folks. A ton of them. Christ told his disciples, Behold, I send you out as sheep among the wolves. Indeed, that's the way it is. Yeah, and you have a fantastic holiday, ladies and gentlemen. Tomorrow we won't be on the air. We'll be back Wednesday. Remember, he is the reason for the season. In fact, wise men still seek him. Remember that always. And that's my message to you. Have a great day tomorrow. God bless you mightily. Be well. <laughs>